I thank you very much Ibu Emily, Ibu Hermin, and also Pak Yudhistira for uh, making the time to share with us in your very tight schedule. Yeah. Uh, and we would also listen to a group of students who will share the results of your uh, of their mini research, yeah, about a new wedding tradition and also uh, education in this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I would also uh, thank you, Bu Dewi, for mentoring all the students to manage this kind of uh, wonderful event. Yeah, so everyone, enjoy the webinar. Uh, hopefully, this webinar will encourage us more to preserve our culture and keep doing positive activities during this pandemic. So, thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mrs. Yohana. All right. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce my fellow also from Bachelor of Applied English Program Study 2020, Pekacana College of Universitas Gajah Mada, Safarina Vanessa. Safarina will be the moderator of today's sessions and discussions. So, Safarina, the screen is yours. Thank you, Guzian. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 23rd webinar event talk with the theme preserving Indonesian culture heritage and creating positive activities during the pandemic. First of all, let me introduce myself once again. I'm Safa from the Bachelor of Applied English Study Program, Batch 2020. It is my pleasure to be here as the moderator for this webinar. Before we get started, I would like to explain the agenda of our discussion in today's webinar. We will have three sessions of presentation and Q&A session. For the first session, we will have Ms. Emily Hansel Clark, PhD, who will talk about the Japanese gamelan in Suriname and the Netherlands, and Ms. Hermin Kromorjo, who will talk about stitching Manggar Megar and her gamelan group within Kelapa. The second session will be a presentation from two groups of UGM students, batch 2021. They will talk about virtual wedding, new tradition carried out in the era of the COVID-19 COVID pandemic and parental support for child's education during pandemic. Last but not least, we will have Mr. Yudhistira Hendra Pramana, PhD. He will talk about visiting the UK and something that we can learn from the tourism and economy aspects. And once again, I would like to remind that all participants are allowed to deliver or type their question, comments, concern, or thoughts only in the Q&A session because the chat box will be used by the committee to do spontaneous translation. So with further ado, let's start with the first speaker. She's a lecturer in the Department of Arts and Culture Studies at Erasmus University of Rotterdam, and she's a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Humanities at Free University of Amsterdam. And in this webinar, she will talk about the Japanese gamelan in Suriname and the Netherlands. Now, allow me to welcome Ms. Emily Hansel Clark, PhD, to deliver her presentation for 15 minutes ahead. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Emily with a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here um, this morning in, in the Netherlands. Um, so thank you for inviting me, Ibu Devi, and um, I've been emailing with uh, Nobita, so thank you. Um, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen. Oh no, I, I can't. <laughs> um, could you enable me to share my screen? Yes, please wait, miss. No problem.
Yeah, great. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk a bit about how the Javanese gamelan tradition developed in Sur Suriname. Um, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to study this topic. Um, I'm an American musicologist and I first encountered the Javanese gamelan as a student in the US. I learned to play in the Javanese style with groups in Ohio and Chicago um, and later got the chance to play gamelan in Indonesia. Um, and later I learned that there were also Javanese people in Suriname and I wondered if they also played gamelan there. So this started my journey learning about Javanese music and culture in Suriname and in the Netherlands, uh, where I now live. Um, I wrote my PhD dissertation on this topic, um, and I finished that in 2020. And I now work in the Netherlands as a university teacher and a researcher studying music and culture and Dutch colonial history um, and migration. So this is a map of the Dutch colonial empire. Um, do you know where Suriname is on this map? Um, as an American, I didn't know where Suriname was when I first heard of it. Um, so it's here where the arrow's pointing on the Caribbean coast of South America. I'm going to talk about how people came from Indonesia to Suriname um, along this path and how they brought cultural traditions like the gamelan with them on this journey across the world. And then more recently, um, I'm also gonna talk about how these traditions have traveled from Suriname to the Netherlands. So um, this talk for the next 15 minutes will have three parts. Um, the history of the Javanese migration to Suriname, the development of the Javanese gamelan in Suriname, and um, the travels of the gamelan from, the Suriname, from Suriname to the Netherlands. And then my colleague Ibu Rumina Kromorejo will talk further about um, the current activities with this gamelan tradition in the Netherlands. Um, I'll also show you some examples from my field work, some videos that I made, so you can hear the sound of the instruments and the styles of the Surinamese gamelan. And afterwards, Ibu Rumina will um, tell you more about them. The Netherlands had a large colonial empire that was included um, both Indonesia and Suriname. In Suriname, the colonial economy was based on plantation agriculture. So growing export products like sugar and coffee on large plantations. And um, originally the people who worked there were enslaved Africans from Africa. Um, but in 1863, slavery ended in Suriname the European plantation owners and the Dutch colonial government needed to look elsewhere for labor that would keep this system alive. So after bringing some workers from India, the Dutch found that the simplest solution would be to bring workers from somewhere else in the Dutch empire, and that was Indonesia. So between 1890 and 1939, almost 33,000 people were brought from Indonesia to Suriname. These thousands of people actually came from different parts of Indonesia. Um, so Central and East and West Java, but also Madura and Sumatra and Borneo. And they did not always come by choice. A, a lot of people later said that they were tricked or coerced into it. On the ships on the way to Suriname, um, they were leaving behind their old lives and formed new families and kinship relations. And in Suriname, they became known as a group, as the Javanese. The conditions on the plantations were quite bad, not much different from what the enslaved laborers from Africa experienced. The Javanese workers were technically free, but they had low wages, long work hours, few breaks, and they signed on for five-year labor contracts that they were not allowed to break, so they had to work for five years in these conditions. After the five years, many could not afford to return home to Indonesia and instead stayed in Suriname. There they kept working on plantations as free laborers or started small farms themselves. Today, Javanese is one ethnic group in Suriname, alongside Hindustani, Chinese, Maroon, Creole, Indigenous, and other groups. Um, so Suriname is proud of its multiculturalism that comes from this history of migrant labor. And you can see here in a historical photo and in contemporary ads, 
um, that the country is represented as this kind of happy multiculturalism with a number of population groups that live side by side, um, including the Japanese, you can see here. In current politics, it's not always true. There's also conflicts between groups and their interests, but Suriname does have a robust musical and cultural life that includes many different cultures and traditions. Now I'll talk a bit more specifically about how the Japanese gamelan tradition developed in Suriname. And you can see here a photo of an early gamelan in Suriname. So different percussion, pitch percussion instruments and gongs and, and a drum. When the first Japanese laborers arrived in 1890, they didn't bring musical instruments to the plantations, just the memories of their homeland traditions. The first set of instruments came from Samarang to Marienburg Sugar Plantation in 1903. They were brought by the Dutch Trading Company, the owner of that plantation, in order to give the workers something wholesome to do in their spare time. And the first gamelan was used as a kind of reward for good workers, and it was controlled by the plantation administration. But the workers quickly took gamelan music into their own hands. Based on this gamelan at Marienburg, different individuals built and tuned their own gamelan sets from scrap metal on plantations all over Suriname. This resulted in smaller, simpler sets of homemade instruments. Um, and here's one example from uh, Mungo, Eastern Suriname around 1930. Um, and you can see the, the homemade instruments um, on the bottom right side. These simple instruments form the basis of the Surinamese gamelan tradition today, and they're still made of iron rather than bronze, like you would see in Jogja. Um, here you can see uh, a bonang and sarans, um, and in the back, a gong. Um, instead of several small pot gongs, this is the, the bonang, the Surinamese bonang on the bottom here is made of suspended rectangular metal plates. And for the large gong of the gamelan, instead of big round hanging gongs, the Surinamese gong on the right is a simple metal plate suspended over a wooden box. And the wooden box helps the sound to resonate with the depth of a larger gong. The knowledge to make Surinamese instruments has been passed down from the plantation era. And now only a few people in Suriname and in the Netherlands still have this knowledge. So this is one recently made set of instruments in Suriname. Um, and you can also see the instruments are on stands. They're raised off the ground. So to play the instruments, the players often sit in chairs rather than sitting on the floor. That's also a difference from the Jogja or a Javanese tradition. Um, so now I want to show a few examples of the gamelan in Suriname uh, from my field work. So I have uh, four videos here, and I'll just play a small clip of each one. So you can hear, perhaps, um, if you're familiar with the, the gamelan tradition in Java, some differences, um, what the instruments are made out of. You can hear the sound of iron um, and maybe some differences in the style of playing. So this first example is from... Um, uh, I recorded this in Suriname in 2017, and it's a, um, a, a Wayang uh, shadow puppet show with a gamelan accompaniment. So I'll just play a small clip. <laughs> Can you hear it okay? I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm sharing the sound. Let me share it again. Okay, this should be better. The next example, so this is in a different part of Suriname, Suriname in the capital Paramaribo, 
um, in, in 2018. And this is another Wayang puppet show. This one is for the holiday Bursi Desa. So the um, yearly cleansing of the village um, that happens in the fall. Oops. The gamelan is used in different contexts in Suriname, just like in, in Java. Um, another thing I had the chance to see was a, a wedding. So it's a the wedding in Suriname, it was quite small in a, in a village called Lely Dorp. Um, you'll see it's much smaller than a, a wedding in Java. And then um, after the wedding, they also had a slamatan, um, a, a feast for the neighbors and, and family. And then finally, I wanted to show a clip of a Jaran Kabang, a horse trans dance that comes from Eastern Java. Um, and now it's a very popular kind of entertainment in Suriname. There's a number of groups that do uh, um, Jaran Kabang. And um, that's also accompanied by a, a small gamelan ensemble. Um, so here's a clip of that. You can see the performers going into trance, and you can also see in this video. This was recorded at Marienburg, where the old plantation where the first gamelan came, and you can see in the background some um, old plantation buildings that are still there, um, that are um, 100 or 150 years old. Suriname gained its independence from the Netherlands in 1975. Around that time, many people from Suriname, from all of its different ethnic or cultural groups, moved to the Netherlands. Now there are many Surinamese Dutch people in the Netherlands, um, including Surinamese Javanese. Um, Javanese Surinamers coming from Suriname to the Netherlands brought many cultural traditions with them. For example, here's a photo of a Surinamese warung or cafe in Amsterdam. Um, Surinamese Javanese food can be found all over the Netherlands. It's very uh, popular. Of course, the gamelan tradition came along too. Some people migrating to the Netherlands even brought gamelan instruments with them that they had made in Suriname. Um, this photo shows one gamelan group in The Hague um, called Gamelan Banguntras Nabudaya, which plays only Surinamese repertoire. In total, there are now seven active Javanese Surinamese gamelan groups in the Netherlands. 
they're often associated with Javanese Surinamese cultural and social organizations. And Ibu Hermina will talk more about the activities of one of these organizations in just a moment. So in conclusion, the Surinamese gamelan has known a long history uh, from the ports of Java to the Surinamese plantations, and now is being played for audiences here in the cities of the Netherlands. What started out of a colonial need, building instruments by hand out of the scrap metal that was available, has grown into a distinct cultural tradition of its own. And I'm happy to have been able to learn about this tradition through its practitioners in Suriname and the Netherlands. Um, and now to share this with you and to bring knowledge about this practice back to its roots in Java, um, Indonesia. Um, so thank you. And I look forward to hearing your questions. I think after Ibu Ramina um, talks first. Thank you very much, Ms. Emily hazel -Clark for giving us such informative and interesting presentation. And it is really nice to see Indonesian culture outside of Indonesia. Okay, then uh, later on, we will have Q&A session with uh, Ms. Emily hazel clark as well as the second speaker. Okay, so the next speaker, she is a housewife and co-founder of Mangar Mugdar Foundation. Also, she takes a role as contact person for internal and external communication. In addition, she has been a volunteer with various organizations for 14 years. And in this occasion, she will talk about teaching Mangar Mugar and her Gamelan group within Kapa for 15 minutes ahead. Please welcome Ms. Herman Kromorjo. Thank you all that you are having uh, me in this uh, webinar. Uh, also with my uh, crew, Mangar Mugar, Vitin Klopo. Thank you very much. I will tell you a, a little bit about uh, uh, the foundation Mangar Mugar, why we started and who, uh, um, and that is uh, 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 my husband and I with the, the late Mrs. S. Joey Cromo. We took the initiative to set up a foundation. Uh, we named this foundation Mangar Mugai and registered it officially in The Hague on October the 7th, 2004. The meaning of Mangar Mugai is blooming, coconut flowers or the coconut blossoms are blooming. And that is what Mangar Mugai is still going on. The story behind the choice of the name Mangar Magai is the idea uh, of a new or young foundation that is still, uh, uh, still going on, or you can say is still blooming. And the goals uh, are the development and preservation of Japanese performing arts in the Netherlands, including the almost forgotten performing arts such as Wayang Kulit and other Japanese theater. That is about Mangar Magai. After a year uh, uh, when Mangar Magai was founded, the Gamlan group Witten Klopo was born. And the meaning of Witten Klopo is the young coconut. In other words, so you, uh, you can see uh, 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 one of the photos of uh, Witten Kloppo in Theater da Dakota with what, uh, the uh, Wayankulet performance. And is the, uh, the, the meaning of the Witten Kloppo is the young coconut. In other words, the coconut blossoms has born a fruit, and that young fruit is Witten Kloppo. We are growing, still growing, because it has not been a major uh, uh, fruit yet. We're still going on. After 17 years, we have to go on. The gamelan uh, instruments come from Solo, Indonesia. You will think Gamelan from Indonesia, solo. I will tell you why. Uh, my husband and I, 
we are uh, on a trip through uh, Indonesia. And uh, the last two weeks of our vacation, we stayed in Solo. And during on our explorations, we came to the Alon Alon, the main square of the Kraton. In one of the buildings, we saw gamelan instruments set up. They, uh, and on the terrace, they saw, we saw people making gamelan instruments as well as how they tuned. So uh, we inspired and we walked over to the instruments and asked the people who were working there on the instruments if they would make some music on them. So uh, my husband and I immediately felt madly in love with these instruments. In fact, these instruments that we uh, 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 have the same scale as the Japanese gamelan instruments that exist in Suriname, uh, the, the, uh, the cylindro. And we, we didn't think twice. We bought it. We bought the 16 pieces of instruments and uh, 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 make it ships uh, to the Netherlands. The gamelan made a, a, a three week trips across the ocean. And this is how we think Kloppo, a gamelan group in the Netherlands started to play Surinamese Japanese uh, gamelan music on a set of instruments from Indonesia. And that is very, very unique. The gamelan group Witting Kloppo is, I, 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 said it, uh, I said it already, is very unique and very special because it has a wide range of ages. So you can see, Everybody is happy there. The youngest one uh, was here six years. Six years up to, let's say, 60 years. And that is very, very unique uh, uh, for a gamelan group in, in, in the Netherlands. I think in Suriname also. And many talented young people participate and they are supported by the knowledge of participants over 50 years old. They participating two different kinds of gamelan music. Within Kloppo plays both uh, music in both Surinamese, Japanese and Indonesian style. And uh, they also company with the uh, uh, Wayangkulit performances and other Japanese theater performances. And every Friday evening, the group comes together to practice the gamelan music under the direction of uh, Mr. Orlando Cromo Paviro. Mr. Orlando Cromo Paviro, also known as Hardio Prayetno, he teaches the gamelan by writing notations of the pieces and sharing them with the group. And during the lessons, each member of the group is taught how to play a gamelan instrument. They also learn to play and to understand the rhythms and the different styles of gamelan music. Mangar Magari is uh, also committed to the preservation of Suriname, uh, Surinamese, Japanese and Indonesian tradition in the Netherlands and for the uh, preservations of the Surinamese Japanese gamelan, Witten Kloppo has worked together with other gamelan groups in the Netherlands under the name of the uh, network under the Surinamese Japanese gamelan network. Uh, the network works with a foundation called Stigi, the foundation for the, uh, for the commercial Moriation of Japanese migration to Suriname. The goal was to have the Surinamese Japanese gamelan tradition included on the list of instigable cultural 
heritage of the Netherlands, and this was uh, accomplished on December the 10th, 2020. So I hope uh, that you all can uh, uh, learn more about the Suriname Japanese gamelan uh, in Indonesia. And this is the young generation. Uh, they played, in, uh, we played on the 10th of October in Arnhem. It was a wonderful, fantastic day. Thank you very much. Oh, and, and, and uh, on the right side, you see uh, my husband with the kandang and, and, uh, <laughs> and you see my little, my, my, my grandson. He is trying to play with uh, his, with his um, uh, opa, opa yot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we come to the question and answer session. The participants may leave comments or question, thoughts, concern to our speakers on the chat box. And if you want to turn the, your microphone on, you may raise your hand first so that the speaker know that you have a question. Oh, I see someone raising their hand. Okay, then I will start with Aida Rahmawati. Okay, thank you, Kak. Uh, is my voice is audible, Kak? Yes, you are. Okay, so actually, okay, my name is Aida Rahmawati and I am the student of Applied English Batch 2021. So actually, I want to ask a basic question to Miss Emily Clark. I want to ask you, uh, you are a lecturer in the Department of Arts and Culture. And of course, you know uh, a lot of culture from several countries. Uh, is there uh, any special reason why you are interested in learning more about Gamelan? Uh, if compared to other art, arts culture that you have studied, uh, what makes Gamelan special in your eyes, Miss? Thank you. That's that's a nice question. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've um, learned about the gamelan for um, quite a while, almost twenty years now. So when I first heard it, I was um, yeah, like um, maybe eighteen years old, and um, and I saw a gamelan group um, at, at my college, uh, at my university, and um, yeah, I think. Um, I, I really liked it and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can describe exactly why, but for me, there's maybe two reasons. One is that I'm very interested in the history of this migration and the way that the gamelan changed as it moved from Indonesia to Suriname to the Netherlands. Um, I think it's a very interesting history that's not just about music, but also about labor and um, culture and people um, moving and, and bringing memories and this sort of thing. But on the other hand, there's also the reason that I, I like the sound of the gamelan very much. And I think it's a very um, beautiful kind of music and very diverse. There's so many different styles and traditions. There's, you know, slow, quiet gamelan or really fast, fun gamelan. So I think it's a it's a tradition that really sounds different every time you hear it. And I think there's so much more to learn. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I think maybe in the, the 20 years that I've learned about the gamelan, I have maybe only just learned a very small amount. I think there's very much more to learn. So yeah, I would say both for the sort of academic reason and for a personal reason that I think it's also a very beautiful music. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Mies. Okay, thank you. And we have the next uh, person who wants to ask question, Arya Purnawarman. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. So my name is Arya Purnawarman. I'm so sorry I can't turn on my camera because I have a bad connection. So actually, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is for Miss Emily Clark. Is there any uh, 
specific differences between gamelan in Suriname and Indonesia. And the second question is for Miss Del, is in the Netherlands the gamelan group the I mean the the song or the the playing is the mix between Indonesian and the Suriname gamelan too. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. So um, sure, I'll, I'll answer the first question. Yeah, I think there's a lot of differences um, and a lot of similarities too. So perhaps you could hear that a little bit in the music. Um, I think the some big differences are the material. Um, so the gamelan in Suriname is made of iron rather than bronze. Uh, there's some gamelan traditions, I think also in Indonesia that use iron, but if you go to the Jogja Kraton or something like that, the instruments sound very different just because they're made of different material of bronze. Um, so that's a difference. Um, the, the structure, the shape of the instruments are different um, and um, the style is different. So you could hear that just a bit in these short examples, but um, I think the style um, in, in Suriname is a bit faster, a bit more um, some people say kind of swinging or maybe even it has a little bit of a Caribbean sound. Um, I don't know that it's hard to say, I think, um, and it sounds different to every listener. Um, but um, but there are certainly these these differences. And um, in the Netherlands, it's interesting to see how these traditions kind of come back together in a group like Reading Klapa that does both styles. Um, so maybe uh, Hermina can um, say something more about that. Okay, Miss Hermin, you can answer the question. Yes, I will. Um, uh, when we uh, learn the Sur uh, Surinamese uh, Japanese style, the gamelan, then we learn that. It is not so that we put uh, 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 those two styles together. That would uh, I would like to do that, but. I think that what uh, would be too different, uh, uh, difficult. So we have an, uh, one uh, an, uh, uh, when we are meeting at the Friday evening. Sometimes we learn the Suriname Japanese one, and sometimes the uh, 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 the Java Java. We uh, we always said the Java Java, the Indonesian style. Uh, about the Suriname Japanese uh, style, just like uh, what uh, Miss Emily uh, said, it is faster. Uh, we 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 play uh, very fast, just like uh, the Latin uh, America style. So we uh, we are playing the style, but here in the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Orlando Cromo Paviro uh, uh, try to learn uh, uh, us how to play it on the right way. Not from, I just hear it uh, from 100 years ago. No, we have uh, an, uh, 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 notations. And so we are playing this on the right uh, way. Yes, we have uh, we have uh, 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 a long way to go to learn this uh, very very well. Thank you. All right, Miss. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the answer. And is there anyone want to ask or comment? Gives comments about the presentation. I see a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Yeah, so maybe I can answer um, a question from Milton who asked about how many gamelan groups are there in Suriname now and what are the challenges they're facing? Um, and yeah, so today there's many fewer gamelan groups in Suriname than there used to be. At some point there were every town had a gamelan group. Um, it was all over Suriname. And today there's only, um, I can't remember the exact number, but 
um, at most seven or eight practicing gamelan groups. Um, and the challenges, yeah, there's very particular challenges in Suriname. One is that um, the younger generations may not have the same interest in playing. Um, so the knowledge is not being given down to the younger people who would like to play the gamelan. Um, another challenge is that um, the economy is not uh, very strong in Suriname. There's a lot of um, economic and um, political challenges that make life quite unstable. So when there's not extra money to throw, you know, a party with a gamelan, um, then there's not as many opportunities for the groups to play. Um, or when people are busy working and, you know, earning enough money to survive, then there's not as much time for a hobby like playing the gamelan. So I think over time there, there are these challenges and it takes a different role in life. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. So that also brings to the theme of preservation of this, um, of this event um, that that's very important. And the work that um, Ibu Hermina does <clears throat> with, her, with her organization in the Netherlands is also very important to bring awareness and knowledge of the gamelan and to help it be a preserved tradition rather than a, a lost tradition. There was also a question from Pak Eddy. Thank you for your question. And he asked um, if we know who played the first gamelan in Suriname and what pieces did they play? Um, and I don't think we know exactly. That was in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and there's not a record of exactly what, you know, who played the gamelan and what music. There's some very few photos from the early 20th century. But I think we can tell some information from the, from the pieces that still are played in Suriname. So the ones that were handed down um, and still are part of the Suriname repertoire. Um, and um, Pak Edi said that he hears the Jawa Timur, East Java flavor. Um, and yeah, I think that the, the, the Surinamese gamelan is also a mix of different styles because the people with that knowledge came from many different places in Indonesia. So some came from East Java, some came from other places and all brought their different knowledge. And each group has a slightly different style for that reason. Wherever the teacher came from, he would bring um, that particular knowledge from that place um, and kind of add those flavors to the recipe. Um, I like that, that metaphor of kind of the flavor of the gamelan. Um, and as a result, every Suriname gamelan is a little bit different. All right, thank you, Miss Emily Card. So, and thank you for all of the questions and comments that has been given in the chat box. Then I would like to take the conclusion from what the speakers have presented in the first session that gamelan in Suriname, it is slightly different because it is faster than um, gamelan play in Indonesia. And Mangrove Foundation is one of the ways to preserve Indonesian culture, especially to the younger generation. And I would like to add, uh, preserving Indonesian culture heritage is important uh, because it is to protect our sense of who we are and it allows us to identify ourselves with others and deepen our sense of unity, belonging, and national pride. Okay, before I go to the next session, please fill out the attendance form, form uh, the link will be provided on the Zoom chat box. Okay, then in the second session, we will have two group presentation from UGM Student Batch 2021. For the first group, they are Amadea Kania, Fina Azahara, Andrea Ajeng, Chandra Devi, and Christian Dharma. They will talk about virtual wedding, a tradition carried out in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. Group one, you may start your presentation for 15, 10 minutes ahead. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amadia Kanya Karmawan, and I would like to say thank you for the opportunity that given to me and my group member to talk about our uh, topic for today. Uh, but before that, could anyone please help us to share the screen? Okay, all right. So guys, today we will talk about uh, 
some particular thing that commonly happen in this COVID-19 pandemic. As we can see, there are limited space to hold some event or ritual that usually happen live and continuously. And because of that, uh, some people decided to replace it with virtual ritual. And today we will talk while when in one example of the virtual ritual, which is virtual wedding, new traditions carried out in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Okay, this talk will be delivered by our group member, which is myself, Amadea Kanya Karmawan, and the second is Fina Zera Sofanika, the third is Adria Jeng Chandra Devi, and for the last is Christian Dharma Saputra. Next. Okay, guys, before we jump into our talk, let's get to more let's get to know more about the definition of virtual ritual. First, I will explain the definition of virtual ritual because this virtual ritual is a new thing for all of us, so it will be nice to know in advance what the definition behind it. First, virtual. Virtual is existing or occurring on computers or on the internet, being on or simulated on a computer or computer network. We've got this definition from Merriam-Webster dictionary. The second is ritual. Ritual is a ritual is a formalized mode of behavior in which the members of the group or community regularly engage. Religion represents one of the main contexts in which rituals are practiced, but the scope of ritual behavior extends well beyond religion. Most groups have ritual practices of some kind. Christmas 2019. So a virtual ritual is a series of separate cultural activities performed with the help of communication media and a few people participate in such activities. Next slide, please. So in this slide is the main reason behind all the changes that happen. This pandemic situation become the main factor of virtual rituals. Because of that, many wedding organizers have new innovation to create virtual wedding. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this slide, I will uh, share about wedding rituals in Jogja before the pandemic. So before the COVID-19 pandemic, wedding in Jogja were carried out using custom and rituals in every procession. So what are the rituals? Below are seven rituals in Yogyakarta, traditional weddings that are usually performed by most people in Yogyakarta. Okay, so for the first procession is installation of taruk, like TP and Tuhan. Tarub is usually installed at the entrance with the intention of being a shade for the house. After that, the installation of BLKTP is the form of woven coconut leaves as a sign that the house is holding a wedding. In addition, tuhan are installed at the right and left entrances, which usually contains plants such as bananas and coconut leaves. And then the second procession is nyantri. The nyantri ceremony is to entrust the groom to the bride's family two days before the wedding. This aim to eliminate all negative things that are considered to interfere with the marriage process. The Siramar procession is usually carried out the day before the wedding. Okay, after that, we have the uh, ritual. It is when the bride to be enters the room and then the beautician dries uh, the bride's hair and perfume her hair. After that, we have Midodareni. So, Midodareni word means bidadari, or in English, we usually call it angel. This procession is when the prospective groom came to deliver or offering the prospective bride. And then the main procession is Akad Nikah. Akad Nikah ceremony is the core event of the entire series of the wedding process. The wedding contract is interpreted as an agreement between the father of the bride and the groom with at least two witness who meet the required procession is called Pangi. Pangi ceremony is a meeting between uh, the groom and bride after, as a husband and wife after being legally married. Next slide. As we know, nowadays, many activities are diverted from offline to online or virtual, whether activities in school, campus, or work. Also traditional wedding ritual. So the question is, how the traditional wedding ritual transform virtually? 
Next slide, please. This new thing also has a background that is adapted to the current pandemic conditions. The virtual joint meeting is also considered a synergy with the government programs to overcome the coronavirus outbreak, especially to help underprivileged people get married, while at the same time growing awareness together in entering a new order or new normal life. Next slide, please. Okay, I will uh, talk about this slide. Okay, in this slide, I'm going to talk about what the differences and what needs to be adjusted between virtual marriage and marriage in general. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many points in wedding in, uh, eventually shift, changed and were modified to suit existing regulations. Of course, this makes couple who do virtual uh, who do virtual wedding have to limit the existing rituals if before the pandemic there were many stages of rituals that had to be carried out for weddings with Jogja custom now these ritual stages have to be abolished due to the limitation of virtual of virtual wedding next Okay, so from some of the things that I have explained before, there is one example of a case that occurred in the city of Yogyakarta. An example of virtual wedding in Yogyakarta, uh, the example of virtual uh, wedding is uh, Yogyakarta City hold first virtual mass wedding in Indonesia. A total of 10 bridal couples from several areas in Yogyakarta held a virtual mass wedding which was named Nika Bareng Virtual. GM Productions Director Yuri Apreto is claimed that this joint, this joint wedding as the first virtual wedding event in Indonesia and even the world. Uh, and then uh, the centerpiece of this mass wedding was held in Ambarukmo Hotel and the others also took place at nine religious affairs offices or KUA in Sleman, Bantul, and Kulam Progo. In Sleman Regency, uh, there were four pairs of brides who participated in virtual joint wedding who were married at KUA Ngaglik, Depok, Turi, and Gamping. Then in Bantul Regency, four brides were married in KUA Banguntapan, Piyongan, and Kasihan. Next. All right. Uh, I will explain about how is the virtual reading implement. Yeah. In Yogyakarta, as many as and bridal couples have the cover program. It's a virtual reading moment. Uh, this virtual reading applies on TM production YouTube channel in Monday, 29th of June, 2020 in the morning. The event was held to coincide with national community. This event is also dedicated to inspire people to be ready yeah, to face the new problem. The organizer of this event is the LED concept and 360 cameras. The reading was held using a green screen background yeah, to add to the excitement of the reading decoration. Technically, the concept of the decoration is applied with a technical green screen, and the bit and groom can choose of a variety of uh, decoration options. For example, design with the uh, for this distinction. 
And then the next slide. Yeah, just before reading the cycle of time. Uh, yeah, the reading so this tool is the same as reading in general. Yeah, now it is the same as the typical basis. It is just a little bit different that the reading is the tool. Then the validity of the reading contract depends on the fulfillment of the pillar and condition. If the reading fulfills the pillar and condition of reading, then it is valid. And if it does not fulfill, then it is invalid. Even the deputy regent of Clement P. Muslimatun also said that although the reading activities were carried out differently, yeah, but the happy atmosphere at the during event was not different yeah, from the reading of the regular couple, it was carried out practically and normally. And then the next slide, yeah, the last slide. Is constitution. This ritual reading has become yeah, a new tradition in the midst of the COVID 19 pandemic era. This tradition is now within a protocol, right? And then, uh, that's, uh, using hand sanitizer, mask, and clothes without eliminating the statement of the event itself. Then the existence of the COVID-19 pandemic has also stopped the economic cycle, especially for event organizers. This new tradition, a new creativity creation for event organizers, and of course being able to turn the wheels of the economy again. Okay, that's a very good point about virtual wedding that are held in Yogyakarta. The actual wedding party usually happen big and crowded and now replaced with a virtual event in order to still hold the wedding ritual and stop the spreading of COVID-19 pandemic. I think this virtual wedding will be the best way to choose. Okay, guys, maybe that's all about our presentation. Uh, we ask for your apologies if we have a lot of mistakes, and we hope that this talk will lead you guys into some brand new knowledge. Thanks for your nice attention. Uh, see you guys in another time. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the presentation, Group 1. We will have Q&A session with Group 1 as well as Group 2 later on. So let's move on to the second group. Uh, in the second group, we'll be presenting about parental support for child's education during pandemic. The group members are Anissa Alifia, Alfaj Mujtaba, Aninda Pramesti, and Anida Rahmawati. Group two, please you may start your presentation for 10 minutes ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining this webinar. It is an honor to see you here. We are from group two, and today we will present about parental support for child's education during pandemic. Next slide, please.
Okay, first of all, let me introduce our group members. My name is Anissa Alifia Mati Putri. The second presenter is Aninda Pramesti. The next presenter is Aida Rahmawati. And the last presenter is Alfas Mujtaba. And these are the topics that will be discussed today. The first is COVID-19 pandemic, the impact of pandemic on education sector, and the parental support for their children's education, the factors that influence parental support on children's education, and the last is the impact of parental support on children. Next. How parental support impact child's education during pandemics? Now, let's us move on to the material. But first, before we go to the further discussion, do you know what is child definition? Next. According to Convention on the Rights of the Child, 1989, a child means every human being below the age of 18 years, unless under the law applicable to the child majority is attained earlier. It defines children as all human beings below 18 years old. Next. And I will talk about COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted negatively all across the world, especially in Indonesia. Millions of people have died as a result of this virus, including healthcare workers who are the first to deal with the virus. To prevent the virus from spreading wider, some preventative actions must be taken, such as wearing a mask all the time, washing hands, social distancing in a crowd, and maintaining a strong immune system. Moreover, it has a lot of impacts on all elements of human life, including economic, social, cultural, health, law, and education. Next slide, please. A significant impact was also seen in the education aspect. The government has decided to abolish school-based teaching and learning. E-learning is one of the solutions during the pandemic. Many kids learn from home are unable to interact with the teachers or classmates. So it has an impact on some kids' learning styles and abilities. Next. And the impact of pandemic and education sector will be delivered by Aninda Pramesti. Aninda Pramesti, time is yours. Thank you, Icha. Now I will explain about the impact of COVID-19 COVID pandemic on the education sector in Indonesia. Pandemic gave an impact on various sectors, including the education sector. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a major impact and change on the world of education. The world of education has turned around. The pandemic has caused a problematic of online learning to have occurred almost all over the world during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to UNESCO 2020 data, it was predicated that 91.3% or around 1.5 billion students in various countries would not be able to participate in learning activities due to the increases in cases of spread of COVID-19 virus. Including in Indonesia, based on Central Bureau of Statistics 2020, the approximately 45 million students in Indonesia, or it, it can be said that 3% of the total data global students who cannot participate in learning changes in the world of education, the Minister of Education and Culture issued a policy in the form of Minister of Education and Culture Chilpola Letter number three of 2020 concerning prevention of COVID-19 in the education unit and number 36962-MPK.8-HK 2020 this policy stipulates that the learning process that is usually carried out in school is turned into online learning to avoid increase in the number of patients caused by COVID-19. By changing the learning process, of course, it will have other impact and obstacles in its implementation. And the last is COVID-19 increase 
the risk of the dropout for children in Indonesia. An increase in the dropout rate during the pandemic by 1.12%. A survey conducted by United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, or UNICEF, Note that as many as 1% or 938 children aged 7 until 18 years drop out of school to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on this data, almost 75% of children report dropping out of school for economic reasons, and the rest are caused by other reasons such as deciding to work, getting married, and lack of online learning facilities gendered and disability status of the children matter. Girls were 10 times more at risk of dropping out of school than boys due partly to rise in early marriage. As the COVID-19 pandemic had limited their opportunities to obtain adequate learning support according to their needs, children and adolescents with disability face three times higher a risk of drop out as compared to their counterparts with no disability. One of the factors that influence the continuity of children education in Indonesia is the role of the parents. Parents have a big role for continuity of their children education. So now we will move to the discussion about parental support in their children education that will be delivered by Aida Aida, time is yours. Okay, thank you. So we move to parental support in their children's education. So there are uh, three ways uh, that parents is do. Uh, first is monitor their child's school progress. Two is one-on-one -on -one talks between parents and children. Three is being a role model for learning. Next, please. So, uh, according to Jared Myrickle, uh, an expert at the Tennessee Department of Education's Common Core Leadership Council, there are five ways to monitor children's progress for Common Core standards uh, of success. First is check the results of graded assignment, quizzes, uh, and tests. Consult with the child often about graded assignment early in the year of education find out how the child's teacher communicates grades and then be consistent in monitor the child's progress. Two is measure how efficiently the child completes the task. Don't wait for, don't wait for grades to see how your child is progressing because educators use formative assessment to monitor student progress. It involves uh, assessing how efficiently students can complete assignments that have no value uh, directly attached to them. Parents can do this at home by tracking how successfully the child completes homework, identifying if the child is having difficulties uh, or not. The third is communicate with the teachers frequently to check the child's progress on important standards. Reach out uh, regularly to discuss the child's progress on the skills and concepts that are important to their grades or course. Fourth is talk openly with your child about his understanding of skills and concepts. Take the time to discuss important content regularly with your child. This could be as simple as asking a question about what they studied at school or what kind of homework uh, they might have. And the last is appreciate every child's work. Uh, like, don't forget to uh, encourage your child when, when they are successful with a certain skills or concept. Next. And one-on-one -on -one talks between parents and children. Talking to children can help parents understand their feelings and concerns while, while at home during a pandemic. In addition, private conversations between parents and children can build a good and healthy relationships. And the last is being a role model for learning. Parents are important influence for children. As parents, parents influence a child's basic values such as uh, the issue that related to educational choice. And the stronger the parent-child relationship, the more influence parents have. Next. 
So to support our research about this parental support in their child's education, we conducted two research interviews with parents of a child in kindergarten and elementary school about how they support their child's education during this pandemic. So we have Ms. Rose and Ms. Muslima. Next. So uh, the first interview is, is Miss Rose. So Miss Rose is a 31 year old housewife who has a daughter named Feli who is five years old. Feli is currently attending kindergarten and her school is offline now. These are the methods that Miss Rose has taken to support her child's education in the midst of this pandemic. First is take her daughter to school and accompany her to study at home. Two is freeing her daughter to explore in their own. Third is monitor the development of uh, her child by looking at her schoolwork. According to Miss Rose, her daughter, Feli, is quite smart and diligent during online and offline school. Miss Rose never forced her to do the task immediately. Miss Rose usually waits until Feli wants to do the homework. If she still does not want to do the task, Miss Rose spoke and gave a, a kind and gentle example to Feli why she had to do the task. Uh, fourth is as much as possible when her child is steady. There should be assistance from parents and family. If Miss Rose is not at home, she asks her sister to watch over Feli while, while she is studying at home. And last is considering her child Feli is still in a kindergarten, she does not burden Feli to start the to study hard, but she always communicates to Feli what she wants to know. Next. Next is second interviews is with Miss Muslima. So Miss Muslima is a 42-year-old mother who works as a gymnastic coach. She has a son named Damar, who is 11 years old. Damar is now in grade five of elementary school. These are some methods that, that Ms. Muslima have to support her child to support her child during the pandemic. First is communicating study schedules outside school hours. So Ms. Muslima discusses the study schedule with her son. For example, if the schedule is set for two hours, which means uh, 120 minutes, then uh, 100 minutes is for studying and 20 minutes is for playing games or watching TV. And uh, second is appreciate her son efforts in learning by giving rewards. Miss Muslima uh, usually give uh, her son gifts as a reward when her son is reach the learning targets. In her opinion, by getting small gifts and praise, children will be happier doing things such as studying and will give better efforts uh, in the future. And the third is accompany her son to study. Uh, so Miss Muslima is has flexible time so that- Hello, group two. Sorry uh, to interrupt, but uh, can you make it faster or just jump into the conclusion? Because okay. we still have q &A session. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next is to increase the effectiveness in doing the task. Ms. Muslima runs an online learning service application for her son. Also monitor gadgets while their children are studying. Uh, next will be delivered by Alphos. Okay, thank you, Aida. This is, uh, I want to share about factor that influence parental support in child's education. Okay, there is four factors. The first is economic factors. Second is education factor. Third is parents' uh, personality, I mean. And the last is number of children. Okay, I want to explain one by one. The first is economic factor. Why? Because all of this economic, such an economic level in the family will have a negative impact on parenting applied by parents. So that is also has a negative impact on children. Behavior. Manuel, a high socioeconomic level in the family has the potential to lead to positive parenting from parents and also a warm attitude toward children. So that is a good impact on children behavior. 
Second is the education factor. The level of education has major influence on parenting parents. Namely, if the level of education of parents is low, then the parenting given to children will be potentially negative. While parents who have a high level of education, then the parenting applied will potentially positive and all of will have a significant effect on children behavior. Third is personality factor have a big influence of parenting, uh, namely if the personality of the parents is angry, it will have a bad impact on the child behavior. But if the personality of the parent is loving and always warm to the child, the result will have a good impact on the child behavior. And the last, the number of children will have negative impact on children's patterns. Even though parents try to understand their children, but there is only one negative behavior sound on children. It is better for parents to follow the government program, namely a family planning, family planning for two children is better. So that parents can determine children that should be born because by having children with many parents, it will be difficult to divide their time and there will be a lot of negative behavior. So to children such as diabetes, competition, selfishness, and power behavior. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Aiden. Uh, this is, I want to share the impact of parental support on children. The role of parents is very important in assisting children to become their children because good mentoring is a factor in the process of growing and developing a child. The existence of assistance provided by parents to their children in carrying out learning activities at home will affect behavior then leads to discipline in learning a lot of children daily lives are spent at home if parents don't care it makes children difficult to learn all right there is three uh, parenting style the first is authoritarian parenting uh, this is have regret results in raising their children it's violation uh, i mean two? yeah uh, sorry to interrupt but the time is up so we have to move to the next session oh uh, okay I believe all of us uh, would like to hear more about uh, this topic, but let's just jump to the, uh, the next session because you may have a lot of questions, right? Okay, so uh, now we come to the second session of question and answer for group one and group two. The participant may leave comments, uh, concerns, thoughts, questions to our, group, our speakers on the chat box. If you want to turn the microphone on, you may raise your hand so that speaker know you have a question. And okay, I see someone raise their hand. Okay, Natasha Samuela. Uh, okay, am I eligible? You can deliver your question. Yes, you are. Okay, sorry, I can't turn on the camera. My name is Natasha Samuela Servina. I'm from Applied English uh, Study 2021. And I would like to ask a question to group two, of course. Uh, we believe every children has right to provide their best education, no exception in this pandemic era. Uh, you mentioned that um, parents, I mean like, Parents' personality influence parental support in child education. And if the case is the children are in the unfavorable situation where there's a disparity between parents' personality in educating them and their children, where their children can handle it, what solution can you offer or do you think the best that could solve this problem due to parents play do to parents play an important role in early childhood education? Thank you. Okay, good too. You may answer the question.
or if it's okay with the group two, then uh, I would like to invite Zahra Shafia to ask more question. Then after after Zahra and Pa Edi in the chat box, um, you may answer your question. Okay, Zahra, please. You may answer right. for your question. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Zahra from Bachelor of Applied Industry 2020. I actually have two questions for Group One. The first one is in the slide you stated that there are several rituals that were carried out before the COVID-19. Is the ritual like nyandri, siraman, ngarik, etc. not practiced anymore or it's just they are not showing it virtually? And my second question is, do you think this new culture will continue even after the pandemic is over? That's all, thank you. Okay, so group one and group two, you may start to answer the, those questions. Okay, may I uh, answer the question from Mbak Zahra? Yes, please. Okay, first of all, thank you for the nice question. Uh, I, will, I will answer for the first question. Uh, the differences between the virtual wedding and the wedding before the pandemic is um, oh before that I want I want to uh, I want to tell uh, we are from group one also have a research with Basuto um, Wiyoso he is a MC he is a master of ceremony uh, in Japanese language Japanese language and. He also uh, conducted in many, I'm sorry guys for the noise. Uh, he also conducted many of uh, wedding virtual or like uh, wedding before the pandemic also. And I and we interviewed um, Mbah Suto and he answered that um, the, the differences is when, when the pandemic is, uh, when, when, when wedding is held during the pandemic, it's usually they just uh, contain the ritual, the ritual only for pangi, the last ritual. So they, so they, uh, they like, they have several ritual inside the pangi, and then uh, they uh, abolish the other rituals like. Uh, they didn't. They didn't attend. They didn't help the uh, like maybe ngeri or anything else. And for the second question, maybe uh, in my personal opinion, maybe this spiritual wedding will be continued in uh, after the COVID pandemic because I think this spiritual wedding is also bring many beneficial for people that uh, we can we can attend the wedding from several places we can also uh, minimize the economic uh, like spending the money like or we have to be uh, attend in the place so we have a lot of beneficial in this virtual wedding maybe that's all from me maybe uh, from other group member of group one wants to answer. And thanks for Mbak Zahra for the question. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Okay, um, we are very uh, sorry because we are running out of time and we must uh, move on to our next session. And uh, thank you for the question and comments. And group one and group two, you may uh, answer uh, those questions that haven't answered yet uh, through the chat box. And uh, then I would like to take the conclusion from what group have uh, presented that virtual wedding have become a new tradition because we have to adapt with this pandemic situation. And surprisingly, it uh, creates new creativity for events organizer and it can help to turn the wheel uh, of the economy again. And, and in adapting with online education, uh, children spend more time at home, right, with parents. 
and they need uh, companionship, right? So parental support and treatment uh, can help in shaping children's behavior and action during their education in the pandemic. Okay, so the next session will be the last presentation and we will have our amazing speaker, uh, Mr. Yudhisthira Hendra Pramana, PhD. He's a lecturer and the head of property management and evaluation in the Department of Economic and Business, Vocational College at Universitas Gajah Mada. And he actively conducts some researches. He is involved in the project health financing activity as a researcher. Also, he participates in Indonesia Behavioral Economics Forum, or IBEF, as researcher and development coordinator. Now, allow me to welcome Mr. Yudhisthira Hendra Pramana, PhD, to deliver his presentation about visiting the UK and something that we can learn from tourism and economy aspects for 15 minutes ahead. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Yudhisthira with a lot of applause. Thank you, Safarina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, can you please set me as the host? Otherwise, you should uh, present my slides that I've sent you some uh, today, yesterday or two days ago. <clears throat> so, yeah, again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, let's make this uh, session, my session, a bit more fun. <laughs> In this chill weather, nice weather. Well, you know, if that's, if that's nice or not. In your place. So, can you please set me as a host so I can present my presentation? Otherwise, you should present mine. Right. So, where's that? Okay. Right. Okay, sure. You can share. Yeah, many thanks. So, you all can see my presentation right now. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> um, um, when uh, today we uh, asked me to uh, present in this uh, event, I don't know what to talk, and yeah, we discuss about uh, things on the, uh, like a social behavior or something like that, and given my experience in uh, living in the UK uh, for my study for four years, so yeah, uh, we gonna talk more on that, and let's make this so I said, uh, let's make this uh, presentation a bit more fun. In the last session, right? So, <clears throat> the UK, what do you think of the UK? Um, the touristic place you might uh, want to visit uh, the country. But uh, as far as I know, the, the people, especially uh, from Asia, uh, think of the UK as in London. So. If we take a look on the memes, <laughs> every part of the UK is called London, 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 and uh, yeah, that that is that is reasonable because uh, you know London is uh, the best city to visit according to the survey, like uh, you know, see and travelers or something like that. Yeah, and uh, given the data, twenty one point seven million people visited the UK in the twenty nineteen, that is increased from fifteen million in the two thousand nine. Uh, so that's a Big number, right? Uh, uh, for a city, a single city, to be visited. However, however, yeah, London. We talking on Palais, uh, uh, Big Ben, the Tower Bridge, or the Greater London, including the Stonehenge and etc. Um, we got not we. I mean, the UK got more places to visit. For example, uh, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, or uh, uh, some of you might want to continue study there for the postgrad, master, or even PhD. Well, uh, the Edinburgh House as well, the capital city of the Scotland, the north, they got uh, the big castle there, the Northern Ireland. Uh, if, if you if you watch the Game of Thrones, you might. Um, notice the place here, or other places like in my uh, city when I push my study in York, the old York, right? Not the new one because the new one is in the US. 
And uh, most of the best city to live, not to visit as a tourist, most outside London. You know, for example, Bristol, York, my city, uh, and others. And uh, most of them have panoramic scenery and all preserved historic buildings. You know, talking about the uh, tourism there, unlike Indonesia, they are under the management of National Trust. That is uh, 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 agency to manage uh, those buildings where some of the buildings, for example, castles still owned by a family or, or, or they call all right, in uh, the old days. But for the tourism purpose, they are under national trust at, at this time. So perhaps we can learn something from that. If, if you want to learn more about uh, the tourism, how to manage a tourism, you can uh, look for more <coughs> on the uh, national trust, what they're doing, what their role are, and many things. So talking about the UK or we might notice about the British culture, the languages, you know, the accent. Well, so I'm, I'm not native, but I feel like uh, some influences living there for uh, more than four years. Because some influences on my, uh, you know, uh, how I speak. <laughs> not, not, not talking about the dialect, so my dialect still Indonesian. Uh, um, uh, 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 in general, right? So, British is all about the you know food, the royal family, the weather, uh, social culture. Uh, what else? The education and uh, like you know uh, 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 before before I came to the UK, I see the UK is like, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, it's like in the movies, you know, the, 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 the old buildings, the, uh, you know, things like that, and polite, polite people. However, um, <laughs> it's, it's not all correct. It's not all correct, right? So if you think, or like in the top left uh, picture, if you think all Englishmen or British would say things like that, yeah. Excuse me, sir, I'm terribly sorry to bother you. But I wonder if you would mind helping me a moment as long as it's not trouble for us. Asking for help is not for sure. It's not totally correct, right? So many things uh, that, 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 that I learned to live in the UK. Yeah, uh, UK is uh, divided by so many cultures like Indonesia. Yeah, they got so many cultures, so diverse. Why? Because, you know, uh, UK is the home of uh, the immigrants all around the world, from the Africa, the Asia, uh, South America, uh, uh, East Asia, South Asia, uh, uh, Midwest, uh, somewhere from the parts of uh, the world. So many things are mixed, right? Many things are mixed. I've got friends from Eastern Europe, I've got friends from, well, the Netherlands as well, from the uh, uh, you know, the Emily Clark uh, working at the moment and, you know, talking about the slang as well. Um, <clears throat> so that, that is the reason I put all this, you know, meme perhaps. Uh, if you think uh, the British people uh, speak like, uh, Alice, uh, could you please come over my place to have some tea? That's all wrong. That's so wrong. For example, I live in York, the county of uh, Yorkshire, right? So this is the you know the left side. This is what they uh, mostly uh, speak in general, right? They can get a steak, tell my 
the market for a couple of quick coca. I'll take home and all that as I cook it for free. How much? When we owe, stay up, pill up, get back down, bloody salt. <laughs> That's what I heard. And I learned, yeah, yeah, I learned that, you know, in Scotland, they've got different dialects. Even I've, I've got friends from London there. She is, she is pure British, born and bred in London, grew up in London. Once she visited Edinburgh and Glasgow, in Scotland, going out in North. And what she said, she told me that she didn't understand what they had in Bra endless weekend talking. So it's a bit funny, huh? Eh? Right, you guys the home of uh, more or less 63 million people that surveyed 2020 with very much diversity in race, culture, religion, language, as I said. And if you think the UK is all about the royal family, the uh, uh, fancy things, uh, the old buildings, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, castle ruins, most probably you got it wrong when you visit the UK, like for example, five, one week, five days or one week, uh, uh, just visit in the UK, everything, everything is not about their family. Well, the fact, the fact is kind of a, a crime there. Yeah, so they've got the tourism, they've got some touristic places to visit yes they've got uh old buildings to visit yes but still got the, some crimes there that's the fact they've got uh, you know I'm, I'm 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 not i'm not trying to uh you know uh, uh <laughs> underestimate the country so but that's the fact yeah some places are having a high crime rate uh, you know the stabbing berkeley modern salt theft uh, uh, you know, the youth crime. But the privacy is massively legally protected. I live there, I send my kids uh, uh, to the school there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I work as well in the university, part of the uh, researcher. When I've got uh, a family concern, I can easily, you know, get the leave for that. But it's not about the London. Again, it's not all about the London. Some say it's more very peace, peaceful to live in a smaller town like in Indonesia. But bear in mind that don't expect to earn money, more money than compared to London. London's still uh, a good place like in Indonesia. If you want to earn more money, go to Jakarta. Go to Jakarta, not working in Jogja, for example. Right. <clears throat> However, once again, uh, pretty good to live there. Because if you, for example, bring your family to work, to study there, uh, the public services are mostly free, for example, schools, hospital. Yeah, I've got one of uh, my kids, my son, uh, was born there and it's all free, all free, all free. Uh, going to the park garden, it's all free. Museum, well, not all museum, right? But the big museum like a British Museum and the Scotland Museum are free. Going to the park, if you uh, even if you see New York has a very good park, yeah. Uh, what is it called? Uh, the New York Park, uh, I, can't, I can't remember. So the UK has it, has it as well in the Hyde Park in London that's big in the uh, 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 bottom left corner, right? That's because uh, Central Park, yeah, the name is Central Park. Um, transport and university quite expensive compared to Central European, for example, Germany, Netherlands, as far as I know, uh, even Italy, Spain, uh, France, um, and also entertainment, right? So, for example, the concert, sport matches, you know, when I live, yeah, I've been there uh, several times, and yeah, that costed me <laughs> some kind of big cash. Well, again, I'm not trying to underestimate the country as well, but uh, this is how it's like uh, if you <laughs> stay in England or a UK. Well, <laughs> British weather, uh, pretty much in uh, during during uh, the spring, so you can have four seasons in a day. Like, yeah, that's the meme. Uh, yeah, I've I've got that experience too. In the morning, that is snowy, a pretty big snow. And then uh, 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 the sun is out 
by like a midday 11 to 12 and then big rain and after that in the uh, afternoon 5 uh, 5 p.m the sun is out once again well that is england i, I I'm, I'm pretty sure netherlands got that kind of uh, weather as well like and the summer oh come on don't expect the summer will be like a very very you know very very nice the uh, sun is out you can hang around the a garden the pub or no 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 don't expect that and you know <laughs> I've, I've got i'm still following uh, the news there and uh, especially in, in 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 the city where i live in uh, york yorkshire so <laughs> that's the uh, recent news so yorkshire that left for meeting therapy after forming out 54 uh, pounds for <laughs> portion of his and chips in London. That's, that's, that's a lot. Right. And uh, uh, talking about the food here from there, so nothing fancy, nothing fancy. Like uh, if you follow in football, you must know Jamie Vardy uh, like uh, three or four years ago. He was he was interviewed uh, while well, talking about the food and that is so <laughs> That is what is coming out from him. I don't really like Indian food. I <laughs> really English food like pizza or Chinese. Call, like, come on. And the old place names uh, in the UK, uh, perhaps you, 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 you cannot find uh, the similar things in the Australia or in the US, like you know, uh, in the Wales, they call uh, the place like Lanfair, blah, 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 go, 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 go. Uh, can't even pronounce that. And uh, you know, uh, uh, this one is pretty, pretty true to what I know. Uh, I've got some uh, British friends as well. Uh, my boss is also British, and uh, don't try to uh, mimic in their uh, accent. They don't like it. The cue jumping, they hate it. They hate it. So, uh, you know. Uh, it's all a good queue every every place. Is. <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Tom. Tom. Uh, because uh -huh. of the matter of the time, uh, right. you have two minutes left to okay. present your material. It's okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, everything in, in 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 the UK. This is this is the final uh, talks that I need to spread to you all. It's all about industry in in the UK. When you're talking about tourism, it's industry. It's not about you know tourism. Let's make it like well, it's it's pretty different than in Indonesia. You put you know the love sign, uh, throw it some flowers. You call it tourism. No, it's all about the industry. You make it industry. You make it money from uh, what you're doing there. Tourism. You call it yeah tourism. Football. Well. You're following football as well. I'm, I'm a big fan of football, following much of football. It's all about industry. Yeah, that's why England is, uh, I would say, number one in football, paying the wages, uh, the uh, broadcasts, and etc. Uh, well, they're facing Brexit. Yes, they're facing Brexit. Uh, the, you know, the cost of uh, import will go up. <sighs> <clears throat> well, yeah, I experienced that, but still they survive. Still they survive because, you know, uh, it's all about industry. They, they should make money. When you're talking about music, it's all about industry. It's all about, uh, you know, making your music like that. And well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure if if we Indonesia can make it as industry, the, well, yeah, I know it's, it's a pretty uh, capitalistic. Well, but <laughs> I... I uh, yeah, that's that's the reality that that we have to face, right? If we don't make money from uh, our activities, well, I mean, not not not. It's not about money, but some benefit that we that we can earn, then we can make something more advanced, right? So uh, this is what I learned from uh, uh, living in the UK, uh, having observed there, uh, learning, studying there. And it's all about industry. If we, and if we can make industry so we can make it more sustained. Right, so that's the end of my uh, slides. So if you've got some uh, questions, you can ask me directly. <laughs> Many thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Idistira, for the presentation. It was really informative and 
Yeah, I would like to invite uh, one person to ask uh, directly to Mr. Yudhisthirat and because of the matter of the time and um, we just have to invite you just one person. Is there any question? Oh, we have question for from uh, Milton. Do you really notice the effect of Brexit? Yep. So uh, the uh, the referendum took place twenty sixteen, right? But the you know the is is it was twenty twenty. If I'm not if I'm not wrong, that the Brexit to the deal, right? But during the time between 16 and 20, the price going up, well, the inflation uh, is all across the country as far as I know. And for example, uh, when I came, a cup of coffee costed me uh, in 15, it cost me 1.7, I think the cheapest one. But in 19, 2019, that cost 2.3 pounds. Uh, a cup of coffee, a cup of simple coffee, like a you know americano, no long black, you can call it. So that's the inflation that we that we uh, I mean that I face there. Uh, um, uh, what else? The uh, fruits like uh, grapes, strawberry, that's also increased. So yeah, that's the effect uh, on the uh, you know uh, micro micro aspect uh, the the society, and they hate it. I know they hate it. Uh, and also uh, the um, uh, visa costs or the insurance, health insurance. Uh, so like, you know, in Indonesia, we got PPGS, that's, that's uh, more or less the same, like NHS, they call it in England or in the UK. Uh, also increase, yeah, uh, almost double um, uh, in the three years, like almost double. So yeah, they, they, they also hate it. And, and, I, and I saw many protests for that. Yeah, like why did we uh, vote for Brexit? Like they <laughs> regret the decision, but <laughs> it is what it is, right? Yeah. I have this from the Brexit. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. They they they, they say they they trying to protect the jobs, like you know the small jobs, like um, uh, the shopkeeper. Uh, the part-time uh, uh, kind of things, yeah, they, they're trying to protect that, but what's the point? I mean, <clears throat> the youngsters, uh, uh, fresh graduate from, from Petler, they, they have a protest for that. Yeah, they think, they think that they should go to Central Europe or America, uh, the US for jobs, because not many jobs uh, in the UK recently because of the Brexit, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure about that. We need to have a survey for that and we need to look at the survey. So that's, that's why I know. Anything else, uh, Sabarina? So Pat Milton also have a question, no advantages from the Brexit, but I think uh, you can answer it through a chat box. Yeah, I just, uh, I just answered that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. Then I would like to take the conclusion from what speaker has presented that in England, um, there are many public services that are free, such as yeah, school, hospital, park, uh, library, and museum. And this is what uh, we can follow from uh, from the UK to so that the tourism in Indonesia can um, can uh, increase the visitors from the uh, foreigner outside of Indonesia uh, and also from the domestic itself. Okay, then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we finally come to the end of this webinar. Before our amazing MC closes the webinar, I would like to remind everyone to fill the feedback or the evaluation form that is provided in the chat box. Okay, and lastly, I would like to thank to all of the speakers and presenters 
for informative and interesting presentation and to the all of the participants for very active uh, participation. Hopefully the webinar will be beneficial for everybody. And for the rest of our agenda, uh, I'll give it back to Guzian. Thank you. Thank you, Safarina. All right. Thank you for all the presenters, especially Pak Yudhisthira, because you are the highlight of today's webinar, Pak. We are really honored with your presentation. And also, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar events talk, the 23rd with the theme of preserving Indonesian cultural heritage and creating positive activities during the pandemic. Before we close today's special event, it would be incomplete if we didn't take pictures. So I'm going to open the documentation session. Media team, the screen is yours. I'm going to count down from three. Uh, so uh, if you are able to on your camera, please turn on your camera. All right, I'm going to count down from three. Three, two, one. Another pause, count down from three. Three, two, one. All right, once again, count down from three. Three, two, one. All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we close the event, please don't forget to fill the attendance and feedback forms that the link have already been shared on the chat box because we will send the e-certificate based on the attendance and feedback form. We would appreciate it if you would provide your feedback genuinely and wholeheartedly. On behalf of the, of the committee of webinar event stock, the 23rd, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Participants may leave the rooms and see you for another webinar event talk, the 24th and the next, and the other webinar event talk. The next webinar event talk will be held next week. So please stay tuned with the information. Participants may leave the room freely. Thank you. <laughs>